fired up to get in the Word of God here this evening. Turn, turn my mic on. Turn my mic on. Turn me up. Amen. You know, it's been an awesome devotional so far. Very inspired by the singing, the good news, and all that's happening at USC and UCLA. I know God is moving powerfully amongst us. Amen. But you know, we are living in a world that is not so okay with what we got going on here this evening. We live in a world where what we are doing tonight is absolutely unacceptable. In fact, the world would desire us to do anything else but to shout praises and hear the word of God preached. In fact, we live in a world where over 210 million orphans are in our world today. And 15% of those orphans will commit suicide before they turn 18. 22,000 people die every day from poverty. Not people, children. 80% of the world lives on less than $10 a day. So the next time you think you don't got money, think twice. $450 billion is given to charities every year. But you know how much it would take to actually change and turn back poverty? $32 million a year. 350 million people right now are struggling with depression. 50,000 women are sex trafficked every year. 800,000 divorces occur every year. Right now, there are 195 nations in the world, and only 10 of them are at peace. One in three women are sexually abused before they turn 18 years old. We are not living in, in, a, in UCLA, USC area. We're not living in LA, California. We are living in a dark, dark, dark world. This world is filled with a sickness. Thank you, Siri. It's sick. It's dark. It's demented. Where even some of us, we walked in here, you felt hopeless. You felt depressed, you felt empty, you figured, trying to figure out, what is my purpose in life? We've gotta learn how do we overcome these incredible odds. And so the title of my lesson tonight is, Overcoming a Dark World. You know, I think some people don't think the world is really dark. And so I hope those statistics actually woke you up here this evening. Because here's the thing, if you understand how dark the world really is, then you understand what we are doing right now is the only hope for humanity. Let's turn our Bibles over to Luke 4. In Luke 4, you know, we're, we're, we're jumping into what would be the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And this is how he sparked his ministry. This is immediately after Jesus gets baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. Now, we got a lot of young Christians in here. So you might think, well, well I want to follow Jesus. I know the Bible says if I want to follow Jesus, I got to live as Jesus did. So that means... If you just got baptized, you actually have your own ministry according to the scriptures. That's what my Bible says. So we read here in verse 1. How did Jesus overcome a dark world? Come on. In verse 1 it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, 
And at the end of them, he was hungry. You may have thought your Thursday to Friday fast was a lot. Jesus fasted for 40 days, amen? And so reasonably, he was hungry. The devil said to him, in verse 3, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the campus Devo said, Amen. My first point for you tonight is the deceit of desire. Oh. You know, see here, Jesus going on a little bit of a spiritual journey here. You know, he began, gets baptized, and then, you know, and he's like, you know what? I want to get close to God. I want to set the example. And so he spends 40 days fasting, fighting, connecting with God. He enables us to see that Jesus allows himself to be tempted in every way. But he goes into this desert, and after being hungry, wouldn't you have it that the first temptation that Satan brings to him, why don't you just turn this stone into bread? You're the son of God, right? You see, what is the deceit that Satan brought to Jesus' feet? He says, you can have instant gratification. You know, we live in a world where people want things quick. That if you have a desire that you gotta have it right now, that waiting is not enough. I just can't wait longer than a week to get what I want. I got to have it instantly. I mean, why shouldn't I? I look at the TVs, I look at the commercials, and all I see is people possessing the very things that they desire. So that's how I'm going to mold my life. What I have is not enough. I desire more. And then it goes on, it says that Jesus was tempted also with what would have been something in the future. You see, Jesus' plan when he came to earth in Luke 19, 10, it says he came to seek and save the lost. He wanted to save all the nations. Satan said, I can give it to you right now. Now we live in a world where 18-year-olds are trying to live a 40-year-old lifestyle. Where they're wondering why and they're depressed because they're not millionaires yet. Where we look at these Instagram folks and we're like, man, this guy's got a private jet and he's only 21 years old. How do I gain that amount of money and pleasure and time? How do I do it? So he was promised something instantly and he was threatened with the very thing everybody in here is wildly insecure about. Your future. What am I going to do? Is this possible? Is there hope? Can I do this? Is life going to be paved out for me the way I see in the movies? If not, I got to do whatever it takes to make that happen. This is the dark world we're living in. Because it's absolutely deceitful. When is the last time the world actually promised satisfaction and actually came through? You know, it says in Ecclesiastes that there is an eternal spot in our heart. It says God sets eternity in the heart of men. Wow. And so we spend time in this life not looking for eternity. We're looking for temporary forevers. Man. If I could just feel good right now, it'll, be, it'll feel like eternity. But I got to do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Yet you find yourself in the same place. Empty, hopeless, sad, anxious. We live in a world that's gripped by desire. Let's turn over to Galatians 5. Praise 
Galatians 5. Some, some, some of you guys think where, you know where I'm about to go. But you don't. But you don't. Let's start in, uh, let's go to Genesis. We're just going to read the whole Bible tonight, amen? The whole lesson is the whole Bible, amen? Get us some good insight. In Galatians 5, in verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against all these things, there is no law. You know, isn't this not what we want as individuals? How many of us just want love? We're living in a world where we're just looking to be accepted, looking to be loved unconditionally. And so at first you're like, man, my parents, they're going to be the people to love me unconditionally. And then you get hurt by your parents. You're like, well, that's not where I'm going to receive love. You know where I'm going to receive love now? My friends. Man, Jimmy and, and Sarah, they, they're my friends. They're my friends. So, so when your mom came to you and said, hey, if Jimmy jumps off the bridge, are you going to jump? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just foolish. <laughs> But because you think you're so loyal to your friends, why? Because you think they're gonna love you the way you need to be loved. And so you put all your eggs in that basket. And then you get backstabbed by your friends. You find out Jimmy was dating your ex. Then, then you find out, then you find out Sarah actually is only friends with you because he likes your brother. You get backstabbed by your friends. So what do you do? You're like, you know what? Friends are, it's, just, it's not enough. Okay, what do I gotta do? I got it. I'm gonna get Mrs. Right, and I'm gonna get Mr. Right now. I'm fired up about this. You know what? My boyfriend or girlfriend will never hurt me. He said that he loved me. He said he professed his undying love for me. We was on the phone. He had the phone voice. He was like, yo. yo. Nah, we, you like 17 years old. 17 years old. We gonna get married. Me and I already got the ring. It may look like a ring pop, but it's not. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but you start making these empty promises, and then what happens? Then you get cheated on. And you're like, dang it! You find yourself in an emotional turmoil. And you're like, you know what, people just are, you know what, I can't find love with people. That's not gonna work. You know what I gotta do? Money. Money will do it. Money will do it. Money, 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 money! Money! So what do you do? You're like, man, I'm going to work my tail off. I'm going to grind, 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 grind. And I'm going to stack my bank account with so much money. But then you realize you don't even know what to do with it. You get all this money. But then you start thinking of all the statistics of Robin Williams and all these famous people that have the peak of the human experience that we desire. And yet they kill themselves. And so you realize the futility of pursuing riches. So you're like, no, well, money's empty. That's pointless. Right. I'm just going to get success. Accolades will make me feel better. They'll fulfill that love. People will love me for myself. And I don't have to have connection with them anymore. They'll just appreciate me and love me. Why? Because they respect me. Then that doesn't do it. So what do you do? You're like, man, I just got to have kids. I got to have a little Jesus right here that I know will never hurt me. And then that little baby Jesus of yours grows up to hit 12 and 13 and then realizes that you're messed up and then puts you at arm's distance and that whole sick cycle continues for generations. Wow. We're living in a world that desires love, joy. We think that if I live the Instagram life, I get all the girls and all the money and all this stuff and all the attention that I could possibly have, I'll be full of joy. 
peace. You think that your future is promised you? You're mad. I just, just want to be at peace. I faced abuse. I faced sexual assault. I faced all this stuff. I just want to be at peace. Patience, kindness, goodness are not all these things, things we desire growing up. Am I just tripping? Am I the only one? This is all of us. And to be honest with you, these things are not bad and your desire for them. The sad part is, is you've been sold this way of getting them. It says in verse 19, it says you'll receive it by sexual morality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, and factions, and all these different ways of living. Darkness. You were given this desire in your heart, but you pursued it through the lens of darkness. Wow. You thought sexual morality is the quickest way to get love and acceptance. Wow. So I'm going to have sex with as many people as possible. Wow. Why? Because they, they, they make me feel better about myself. I feel loved. You think all these accomplishments are going to do it, yet you go home at, in, in your bed. You lay down and you cry yourself to sleep. I'm not saying anything that we know has not happened either in our lives or somebody we know. I'm just letting us, I'm here tonight just to beg you from the bottom of my heart, don't be deceived. This world is filled with trying to give you instant gratification to the desires that God has placed in your heart. Satan offered Jesus all the world. And actually, he offered him everything and said, I'll fulfill that desire right now in you. But yet you're only going to get it right now and then forevermore, you'll face the repercussions of your decisions. Let's look at Luke 9. Luke 9, in verse 23, it says, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Forever wants to save his life, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? You know, this is an incredible passage of scripture, but it's one of the most challenging ones for our generation. You know why? Because there's people in these chairs right now that think that the world is actually going to fulfill. You think I'm just crazy. You just think I'm just some weird campus minister that's just like, this guy's just talking because he wants to get me to love God. That's the only reason why he's saying what he's saying. He doesn't know how it tastes. He doesn't know how it feels. He doesn't know how it feels when I have that girl hugging me or that guy embracing me or all this money and all this power and all this facade of respect. You don't know. Guys, I lived that life. To be honest with you, I was probably one of the most effective in that life. I lived a frat life in high school. I, it was late to the party by the time you got to college. To be honest with you, I was going to frat parties at 15 years old. First time I smoked marijuana, I was 12. I had my first drink at eight. I got a part, my family's Puerto Rican, so only time they're having fun is when there's drinks involved. This is the life that I lived. My sport was actually being a womanizer. That's the way that I lived. I was the guy that your sister or you guy, you would have to look out for. I don't know if th th this guy is after me in some way. I was the guy that was really good at playing the best friend role. I'll be your best friend if it's with benefits. That's who I was, guys. I'm not, I'm not telling you, I'm not preaching anything that I myself have not walked through. You think I'm up here preaching because I'm so sad that I made that decision to actually give it all up? I'm not sitting here sad. I know what it feels like to have a one night stand. But some of us are so enslaved. You can't see past your instant desire. You can't see past it. 
And you know what? You're worse off for it. It's only hurt you. Some of us right now are studying the Bible, and the reason why you don't want to give up everything is not but anything else. The Bible's true. You simply don't want to give up your world. You love it far too much. You know why? Because it's easy. It's easy. It caused you to do nothing. Let me just tell you, if it's okay to live by your desires, then nothing separates us from rats. Okay? Oh, okay, do you agree? So, consider it. Rats live by their instincts and desires. So whatever feels good is good, and they just do it. Whatever feels bad is bad, and they don't do it. This is why rats will stay away from you. But they'll scavenge your garbage. And it's the same thing for us here tonight. That if you decide to live by your feelings and desires, you're no more than an animal and you're pursuing garbage. I want to challenge those studying the Bible this evening. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is a plea. This is an important. This is me beseeching you. I'm begging you, just realize the futility of where you're going. Just play out the next five years of your life. You'll have peaked in college. The best times of your life will be you raving at a party where nobody really even values you. Nobody really cares about you. But because it makes you feel good now, you just persist in it. Oh my gosh. I want to challenge you, give it up. It's not worth it because when I studied the Bible, I realized I was like, wow, every one of those statistics that I rattled off are someone in some way, shape, or form. Every dark statistic I'm subject to if I don't make the Bible my standard. How many of us grew up in a broken home? Let me tell us why that that happened. Because some, one of them just didn't have enough. They just wanted more. Or they just wanted it as a business contract. Wow. To where they coexisted just to, just to see through for a little bit more success, to make life a little bit easier, to get that cut break on your taxes. Yeah. We're living in broken homes, guys. But that statistic applies to us if we don't actually uphold the scriptures. Yeah. If you don't actually uphold the Bible. And lose this, what we would call life, Give it up and actually have real life with God. Come on, bro. Okay. Just ask yourself, Romans 6, 21, it says, what benefit do you now have from the things you are now ashamed of? How good is it now? The things you did on those nights, you woke up and just had a crazy beating headache. A crazy one where you were just like, Why did, what did I do? Why did I do that? And you just try to shrug it off with a bunch of laughs and just a bunch of giggles like, man, my friends think I'm cool, so it must be cool. That guy I was pursuing actually liked me, so I think it was cool, so it must be cool. This is the world that we're living in, guys. But we don't have to be deceived by those desires. So let's make that choice tonight for disciples. Those desires don't just come once. It's spring break for UCLA, and USC just had spring break. Right. It begs the question. Those desires creep back up when you got off of spring break or when you're in spring break. Some of us right now just fumbled in all of it. And you know what? You looked at the world and said, it's looking pretty darn good right now. It's looking really good. I don't have to. I don't. Wait, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I don't gotta deny myself. Wow. Whoa. Oh, okay. Dude. Like all my friends will accept me again? Dude. Oh my gosh. 
Sadly, some of us don't even question if we even had real friends. Yeah. The only thing that brought you together was take away the girls, take away the guys, take away the drinking, take away the drugs, and take away the parties and see what you have to talk about after that. Wow. Not much to discuss now. Not much to discuss. We can look at actually desiring God as slavery. But this is true freedom. So many of us have been freed from that way of life and you're sitting next to them if you're studying the Bible right now. They don't look miserable. They came in here singing with all their heart. Why? Because they're no longer deceived by desire. Second point. A crossless Christianity. Let's go back to Luke 4. Let's be a quick point. Pat, pat. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Little pat, pat. Luke 9. In verse 9. I mean, Luke 4 and verse 9. Come on. It says, The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. To guard you carefully, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Dang. I think it's wild that the devil decides to try to tempt God right. with God's word. Yeah. Oh, what does he try to sell him here? He says, if you just throw yourself down, you know what? The angels are going to come, and everybody will see your power. Everybody will see that you are truly the Messiah, and you won't have to die on a cross in order for that to be the reality. You can get that level of impact right now because you're the son of God. See, Satan tries to sell Jesus a crossless version of Christianity. A Christianity where you don't have to die. You don't have to give up everything. You don't have to deny yourself. You don't have to change at all. You simply have to just make it quick, easy, lucky, and free. Wow. A Christianity that costs you nothing. Dang. You know, Satan tries this with us as well. He tells us that Living the life of somebody who claims to believe in God shouldn't be difficult. It shouldn't be a hard life. You're supposed to be the son of and daughter of God. So God should protect you from all your harm. God should make this life a yellow brick road to heaven. Why is your life so hard? Why is your life so difficult? He tries to sell us and put in our minds that this should be easier. He tries to give us a fast food version of Christianity. You know, so many of us grew up in churches where you just went down somebody that kind of, they had Nike dunks on and probably a flannel instead with a nice hat, little rip pants, and was like, I want to, the, the, or, the, you know, the, the nice music played, Fog came on. And they were like, hey, if you want to make the bold, this, the bold decision to follow Jesus with all your heart right now. Just raise your hand. I know it's a bold decision, so let's just close our eyes and just raise your hand. And then why don't you just come down to the altar, and I just want you to say this prayer with me, and so be it, you will be saved. That's too easy, bro. And because of that... You walked out of that with that little pamphlet of the comic book Jesus of how to actually walk with God after that? And you were totally unchanged. Didn't know a lick of the Bible, but had an emotional experience and called it your beginning of your walk with God. You know, it's a sad reality, but it's not a reality that I'm not familiar with as well. I grew up religious. You know how many times I prayed Jesus in my heart? I prayed Jesus in my heart like 17,000 times. Simply because I was like, man, this week, I think I let him out. Like, I just think I, just, I let him out, and it was bad, and I did some stupid things. I got to go bring him back in now. I got to get him back in there. 
The thing is, we don't understand that that is a Christianity that was not created until 1830. Oh. Do, me a, just, just do me a favor. If you grew up and going to a denomination, you can trace every denomination back to a person and not the Bible. These different doctrines that are taught are not even really in the scriptures. They're simply picked out to try to make this thing a lot more palatable, a lot more acceptable, something we can package and sell to the masses. And so now we're living in a world where there's over 40,000 different ways of following Jesus. All of them don't require a cross. You don't have to die. You can simply live the way you're living, but just come to church, put your name on the roll, so I can put on the stats of worldwide Christianity that I have 40,000 members in my church. Wow. You'll never be challenged. I'll never challenge you. I'll never call you to actually have biblical conviction. Simply profess that Jesus is really your savior, but never making him your Lord. You know, we want a crossless Christianity. You know why? Because our generation is not touted for its character. Sadly, we're, we're, we're the most narcissistic, fearful generation. This is just what stats would say. We want things easy. You think they had a little, uh, what are those little carts that bring you food now? What are those things called? Starship. Starship. You think they had starships back in the, back in the early 90s? Where you think they had like like hot pockets, you know, where you can make some food in like two minutes? You you think they had like dry? You had to actually go home and make your food at one point. Oh my gosh! You couldn't purchase meal prep. You had, the meal prep was mom in the kitchen making you food. That was meal prep. But now everything is easier. It's quicker. You now have access to the World Wide Web. You can talk to somebody across. You don't have to write a letter. You don't have to take the time and hurt your wrist and write a letter. We want things easy in you. So you know what's it's produced? It's a generation that has no character. But the number one that the number one place that this is played in is the church. People come to church, but they come and go to where they call you brother. Hey, brother Christoph, but they know nothing about you. It's not actually a family. And so when we suffer, we wonder why, why is God doing this to me? My life should be abundant and full of riches. It should be life to the full. But see, God actually loves you. And so in the same way your parents discipline you and now that you think about it, you're like, man, you laugh about it, you're like, man, I was whooped when I was a kid. Like, my mom tore them legs up, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Wasn't messing around. And you're grateful for it. So we're grateful for the discipline, but though it doesn't seem pleasant at the time, God is the same way. He gives us difficulties and pressures and challenges like some of us are going through right now. Whether I don't care if you're a teen, I don't care if you're in the campus, I don't care what part of life, you're going to face some sort of challenges. But you got to see it as God's great honor because he's investing in you to raise you up so you don't face this where we have a generation where they're putting their wishbone where their backbone should be. If there is no price, there is no promise. If there is no cross, then there is no crown. You know, it's funny. We respect those people that have endured hardship and gotten back up. They faced difficulty and kept moving forward. We admire them. We just, that's it, admire them. We don't want to be them. But we look up to them. You know, you got Abraham Lincoln, who his IQ said was lower than 100, actually. But something he had was character. He lost a job in 1832. He was defeated for state legislature in 1832, failed in a business in 1833, elected to state legislature in 1834. His wife dies in 1835. 
had a nervous breakdown in 1836, defeated for speaker in 1838, defeated for nomination for Congress in 1843, elected to Congress in 1846, lost three nomination in 1848, rejected for land officer in 1849, defeated for US Senate in 1854, defeated for nomination for vice president in 1856, again defeated for US Senate in 1858, elected president in 1860. This guy went from one failure to the next without any loss of enthusiasm. But here we look at this list and we see anxiety, depression, sadness, emptiness. We see that we can't do it. I can't get back up from that. I need to just live with my mom until I'm 35. I can't face this world. But see, here's the thing. I was talking about the general generation. I'm not talking about this room right here because this room right here is unwilling to take a crossless Christianity. You see, Jesus makes it clear. He wasn't going to go through this life and consider the equality with God something to be grasped. So he endured it 100% as a man because everybody he knew, generations after him, would desire the crown of glory, but would be unwilling to endure the crown of suffering. But he understood that there was also hope. There was also hope because then he would have Lizzie stand up and say, I'm going to endure. He would have Brandon say the same thing. He would have Bryce say the same thing. Alan say the same thing. He would have this very room say, I'm willing to endure. But I want to challenge us here because I think this group, in the Southland and in the UCLA campus ministry, USC campus ministry and all the ministries in Southland. I think there can be a greater unity in fighting for each other through these hardships. You know, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. You have to realize that when you're having a hard time and you're being offered a temptation or the easy way out, that your brother or sister is actually facing a similar thing or has done it already. Anybody ever seen the Planet of the Apes? You know when, uh, when Caesar, he's talking to the, to the big orangutan? And they're all like fighting and freaking out. And then they're, he's like sitting with the orangutan and they're just like talking, chatting, like monkeys do, of course. And so he takes a stick. He says, says, why do you do all this stuff? He says, a individual, weak. And then breaks a bunch, says, eight together, strong. And in the same way, in the same way, you just learned that from a monkey, a chimpanzee. (laughs) That if they can learn this principle, I believe so can we. That you by yourself are just slim pickings, man. man. Satan's going to pick you off like it's nothing. But if you stick together with the family, you make these relationships your closest relationships, you make this place your place of vulnerability, then all disciples together are strong. Amen? But I just want to put before us that we don't allow this to fall on deaf ears this evening. That we make the decision that we know the world is dark, but we are not out of the fight. That we ourselves can't overcome if we overcome the deceit of desire. And we don't take the option of a crossless Christianity, but instead we build character. Then I promise you, we will overcome a dark world. I love you guys.